south of the border Down Mexico way That's where I fell in love When the stars above came out to play And now as I wander Hello there, all you expat wannabes. I'm Johnny Mueller, and you're listening to The Expat Files, Living in Latin America, the show that tells you just what it's like to live, work, play, and or retire down here in Latin America. It's a mix of the good, the bad, the ugly, and the great, and it's all right here, so let's get started. You hear me say all the time it's very nice to live off the Gringo Tourist Trail, or live close enough to the Gringo Tourist Trail that you can pop in once in a while when you need the gringo fix, which I really don't need. I haven't needed that for years and years, but some people do. Especially if you just got down or your Spanish really sucks, or you've got no Spanish at all. But, you know, as it turns out, the vast majority of gringos and expats who come down here to live temporarily or permanently or part-time, where do you think they end up? On the tourist trail, of course. I'd say 98% of them do, at least at first. Costa Rica, Panama, Belize, so much of Mexico... And, you know, there is some confusion, even in Latin countries considered way off the Gringo Tourist Trail, like El Salvador, Guatemala, Bolivia, Paraguay. There are certain towns and cities considered to be on the tourist trail. Because, relatively speaking, even in a country way off the Gringo Tourist Trail, there's going to be some town or city, or maybe a couple of towns and cities, that have more gringos than others. So, suppose you're in Guatemala and someone says, where do the gringos hang? That'd be the little town of Antigua. That means in Guatemala, anyway, if you're looking for a gringo fix, you go to Antigua. Although, thankfully, it's not on the heavily trodden, extremely distorted, and picked over tourist trail like in Costa Rica or Panama. Still, as you're walking the streets of Antigua, Guatemala, you're going to run into gringos here and there. Most always of the ecological, backpacking, tree hugger type. Nothing wrong with that. At least there's very few snot nosed, whiny American kids glued to their iPhones. And you know, it's a funny thing, if you're on the Gringo Tourist Trail, sitting with a bunch of gringos who are living or staying there long term, you'll hear complaints. Lots of complaints. Of course you will, because gringos are picky, and when you're on the trail, you're stuck with them all around you. And the main complaints, you'll hear them all the time, in no particular order. The locals are becoming more and more jaded. Governments are changing the residency rules all the time. More and more petty criminals are turning up, targeting foreigners. More and more businesses are out to rip off gringos, and gringo prices are getting worse and worse. So those are the universal complaints from people living on the gringo tourist trail, the usual suspects. Though they almost never stop to reflect and realize that they're the ones that have caused all that. You got the gringos flooding in, changing everything, because they want to have an impact everywhere they go. It's the same. They're so special, of course. They've got all the answers. And the town needs so many things to bring it up to snuff, you know. Yep, that's the gringo attitude. Which is why I so much prefer to live way off the gringo tourist trail. By the way, did you ever hear the word iatrogenic? Iatrogenic. It's an unintended mistake made by a doctor. Like, for example, he removes a bad lung and it turns out to be the wrong lung. Or he cuts out a tumor and you end up with a huge infection and almost die. They call it iatrogenic medicine. Doctor-induced trauma, pain, infection, or even death. Well, in a different kind of way, that's pretty much what happens when gringos invade an area. That's why, personally, after a couple of years, I decided to hang in places where there were very few gringos. Because, you see, when there are practically no gringos, the locals don't get jaded. Criminals don't target foreigners because there's few of us around for them to work out a plan. And as for gringo prices going up, well, when there's no gringos, how can you have gringo prices? Now, certainly I don't mean that living off the Gringo Tourist Trail, there'll be absolutely no gringos. For example, in the ecological subdivision where I've got a place, there's something like 200 lots, and most of them aren't built up yet. And there's only one other gringo in the whole subdivision, an English teacher. Then, if you drive out of the subdivision about, I'd say, a mile, you'll see little farmhouses, tiendas, and some subdivisions. And in one of those subdivisions, and each of those has probably... A hundred houses and condos, maybe more. I believe there's exactly one more gringo living permanently there. That would be Oscar Miner. You might recall him. He's a crypto guy that came down to one of my earlier seminars and ended up living in Guatemala permanently. So it's no random event that he's one of two of my nearest gringo neighbors. All the rest, all the hundreds of people living within a mile or two, they're all Latinos, Latinas, or indigenous people. Now, when you're on that road heading out, you go past various little tiendas. And I've been in all of them dozens and dozens of times. 
And I've asked the guys running the place if there are other gringos around. And they always say, nope, just you. And that hippie-looking teacher and the bald guy. Now, if you keep driving down that road past Oscar Miner's subdivision on to the Pan American Highway, which is about five miles up the road. Now, before you get to the big highway, you'll pass countless very nice little subdivisions, middle and upper middle class by American standards. Well, if you keep your eyes open, you'll see there are surely a couple of thousand people living in the area. You'll see a half a dozen nice strip malls, gas stations, hardware stores. I gotta tell you, I've been spending part of the year there for some time now, and I've never run into any other gringos. And then as I hit the Pan American Highway, and let's say I want to go to the biggest mall in all of Latin America, that's about 15 minutes away. Fact is, I could take a walk through that mall for hours and hours and never see a single other gringo. In fact, once in a while at my expat insider seminars, if we have time, we'll stop in the place. So I can give everyone a good look at the place and they can see for themselves that everything they can get up in Jersey and Cleveland is available down here too. And when we visit that place, they learn something else too. It's pretty much a guarantee when we all get off the bus and do a walkthrough. That's the moment that mall has seen the most gringos in its entire history. You get the picture? Though that's not to say when you're walking through an upper middle class or high end mall, you won't see people that look like gringos. Because it's a fact Latinos aspire to be like gringos, so they dress like them too. And it's a fact that the wealthier Latinos like to keep their race pure and white. They aspire to the gringo and European look. So they're always on the hunt to marry and have kids with whiter and taller looking people all the time. That's not just a trend, that's a tradition. So it's the fact here in Latin America that the higher class and more exclusive type of mall you walk into, the whiter and taller the people you'll see. Oh, but they'll be short, dark, black haired people too, but they'll be mostly the workers and people manning the stores and tiendas. Yep, Latin America is very classist and most of it very racist too. But it's not a black-white racism like we talk about up in the States. It's a Latino or Ladino type of racism against indigenous people. And you'll see it for yourself in a second if you're in a middle class, upper middle class, or high-end subdivision. You'll see Latino house and property owners, Latino kids, and indigenous people who just happen to be the maids and gardeners. The fact is, in middle, upper middle class, and wealthy subdivisions, you'll almost never see an indigenous property owner. They have their own little subdivision, if you want to call them that. Mostly little cement and laminate structures with tin roofs, more or less what we'd call shacks. By the way, when there's any kind of natural disaster, hurricane, earthquake, whatever, those are the subdivisions you see on the 6 o'clock news up in the States reporting missing people and a death toll. You just don't see that happening at all in the middle and upper middle class subdivisions. The fact is, the indigenous people in Central and South America live pretty precarious lives. And the middle class and upper middle class Latinos and Latinos? Well, they got problems, but so do we, right? They're not worried about the basic stuff like clean water, for example. Now, you've heard me say over and over again that most all the water sources in Latin America are polluted, which means you have to personally filter your drinking water or buy bottled water. Now, as for me, I have no faith in bottled water, no matter where it comes from, even up in the States. I've read enough reports to see that a lot of it's just a scam. But as it turns out here in Latin America, most indigenous people don't even have the dough to buy the locally produced bottled water. So they'll take municipal tap water, which is polluted, and they'll boil it or drink it straight. In fact, you drive by any construction site, you'll see the day workers drinking water right out of the tap. In fact, on my own construction sites, I think I've built like 13 homes and offices now here in Latin America. The workers are always drinking right from the tap. By the way, doctors here in Latin America say that's the number one cause for kids missing school, intestinal problems from drinking impure water. Now, you hear things all the time, and you read it in the paper, too. There's a water crisis in Latin America. But, you know, when you analyze it, they really don't. What they have is a water management and maintenance crisis. Because, let me tell you, during the rainy season, if you caught just the water off your roof and you could somehow store it in a big cistern, you wouldn't have to take a drop of municipal water or even well water ever again. And it always seems kind of weird to me. Every single year you scan the headlines and they say there is a shortage of water here, a drought there, and people are packing their bags and moving to the states because of climate change and all that. Meanwhile, when the rainy season comes, and it's a half year down here, unless you live in a desert area, there's so much water you don't know what to do with it. Oh, and speaking of all the rivers and lakes in Latin America being contaminated, well, why do you think that is? It's because less than 40% of all the wastewater in Latin America is treated. 
And even the stuff that's treated, well, you know, this is Latin America. I mean, look, if you toss a couple of drops of chlorine in a 55-gallon drum of poop, you could say it's treated, right? You get the point. That said, here's some Latin American water facts for you. According to the Nature Conservancy, that's a U.S. outfit, 16 of Latin America's 20 largest cities are facing a severe water crisis. Meanwhile, in the small towns and villages and the places out in the boonies, they've got almost no water problems at all, except the people hooked up to municipal water supplies. You know, government owned and operated. You heard me explain why that is on a previous show. The fact that 50% of municipal water is lost to cracks and leaks in the pipes and poor maintenance. Which brings me to Latin American cities I'd never want to live in. For lots of reasons, let's start with permanent water problems. How about Lima, Peru? To me, it's an ugly city that has almost no greenery, and it's considered a desert city. It's nothing but sand, and it almost never rains. And it's got over 10 million people. Not good. Here's something you didn't know. Lima is the second largest city in the world built on a desert. Cairo, Egypt is number one, but they've got the Nile, which is huge. Whereas Lima gets its water from three little rivers, which are very seasonal in their flow, they only produce 2% of the water that the Nile does for Cairo. So just for that reason, and the fact it almost never rains in Lima, I'd advise everyone to stay away from the place, unless you want to fly in and check out Machu Picchu. To do that, you have to fly into Lima. But for actually living, working, playing, and or doing business in Lima, I'd say unless Uncle Julio died and left you his finca, forget about it. Another city I'd never want to live in for a variety of reasons, Mexico City, otherwise known to the locals as Distrito Federal, the federal district. Besides all the other things I hate about Mexico City, people and neighborhoods are so short of water. Water delivery by tanker truck is one of the number one legal growth industries in Mexico City. Meanwhile, as you may have figured, the pandillas, the narcos, etc. have gotten into the act and water trucks are now flanked by armed guards because there are multiple truck hijackings every single day. And they're not stealing the trucks. They're just stealing the water from one truck and selling it in another neighborhood. Another big problem they're talking about is that people illegally tap wells outside of polluted rivers. They fill the tankers with tainted water. Of course, they don't tell their customers it's tainted. But people assume that water in a truck has been filtered and it's pure. The problem is, even if you run it through a halfway decent filter before you drink it, it's still often contaminated with toxic waste residue. Because, you see, most filters will get out the bacteria and the cysts, but to get out dissolved organic chemicals takes a pretty complex filter. Way too expensive. Now, you know, Mexico City has 20 million people. They've got tons of little subdivisions that are very, very poor. For example, one called Itztapalapa. Get this, a neighborhood with 1.9 million residents. Their residents are saying they haven't had a drop of municipal water from the pipes going to the house for two months. And thus daily, the neighborhood is just filled with water trucks. Most of them pulling water from polluted rivers on the outskirts of the city clandestinely. Meanwhile, the rich and wealthy neighborhoods of Mexico City have paid extra to install gigantic cisterns, and they buy the good water from established water truck companies and pay extra, of course. So they have continuous water 24-7. And according to the World Health Organization, wealthy people in Mexico from the wealthy neighborhoods consume about 250 gallons of water per person a day, as opposed to the people in the hundreds of poor neighborhoods in Mexico City who use on average only five gallons of water per person a day. That means wealthy Mexicans use 50 times as much water per person as poor Mexicans. Of course, the wealthy folks pay extra for that, but there's something very wrong with that picture. Oh, and here's another sad fact. In Mexico, the World Health Organization says contaminated water is the number one killer of children between the ages of one and five. On top of that, it's disgusting to note that the Mexican Medical Association claims that practically every single lower middle class and poor Mexican, that'd be over 70 million people, are plagued with worms and intestinal parasites, <laughs> whose origin came from contaminated food or water. By the way, those are the people sneaking into the U.S. too, you know. So does that mean you should be thinking about getting a water filter? Hell yes, even if you've got your own well. Why not? It's cheap insurance. And again, if you want to know exactly what I use, send me an email, thexpetfiles at gmail.com, and I'll send you the plans and the parts list for my portable and my under-the-counter water purification system, too. With all the parts for the under-the-counter setup available at a local pool supply house, or you can get it on Amazon, too. 
and my portable traveling setup available on Amazon for less than 50 bucks. And the great thing about it, it should last you forever. That is, if you treat it nicely, maintain it, and you're not a knucklehead. Just send me an email, thexpetfiles at gmail.com. Speaking of contaminated water, what about contaminated food? Well, you know, one way to ease your mind completely is to shop at one of those gigantic food markets, bring the stuff home, wash it real good, and do your cooking yourself. Now, as for restaurants, you're kind of always taking your chances, even in restaurants up in the States, which is why I have a couple of rules for eating out myself, and I haven't been sick or had Montezuma's revenge in over 10 years. First, I almost always drink out of a bottle. I never use ice because I know the ice machines often are filtered, but you know the maintenance problem here in Latin America, how often they change the filters, if at all. In fact, I've read many articles coming out of the U.S. that have said ice machines up where you live are contaminated too. So for me, no ice. Number three, when I'm at a restaurant, I don't ever eat the salad. However, when you're at home, it's a lot different. You can use your own sanitary techniques, no problem. But, you know, what about other kinds of food contamination? When you buy packaged stuff, like cereals, grains, flour, oats, or rice, or even dried, ready-to-cook pasta. Well, you know what? I rarely eat that stuff, but it probably doesn't matter because, in actuality, all packaged food is somewhat contaminated with quite horrible things, too. For example, the FDA, an organization which I pretty much hate immensely, they have their own list of contamination guidelines. You can go online and check it out yourself. For example, it says right here, and I'm reading it off their website, if you buy a package of paprika, you know what that is, right? It says you're allowed no more than 11 rodent hairs per 25 grams. And 25 grams, that's small, about a half a Dixie cup. And then it says for every 25 grams of paprika, you can have no more than 75 insect fragments, like maggot hulls and aphid heads. Isn't that nice? Yep, no more than 75 maggot hulls or aphid heads, but who's counting? And that is a good question. Who counts these things? <laughs> How'd you like to be standing in front of a class of kindergarten kids at parent day explaining to them what you do for a living? Yes, kids, I count maggot hulls and aphid heads for the FDA. But I digress. Where were we? Oh, yeah. Oh, and here's one. For every 100 grams of frozen broccoli, the FDA allows no more than 59 aphid heads, thrips, and or mites. Which begs the question the hell's a thrip? Which begs the following question. How do they come up with the number 59 as the cutoff? I don't get it. If you got one package with 59 aphid heads and one with 60, you can go ahead and cook up the first batch because the FDA says it's okay in the second batch? Well, let's see. Here, Fido. Who's a good boy? Then we have pasta products. It says no more than 225 insect fragments like maggot hulls and aphid heads per 225 grams. That means you could have one spider leg, fly wing, aphid head, or maggot hull per gram. So next time you're at Tony Roma's, think about that when you're eating your pasta fajur. And for you beer lovers out there, the FDA allows no more than 2,500 aphid heads per 10 grams. And the winner of the most disgusting FDA contamination requirement of all, let's talk fish. A 10 gram sample of whole or fillet fish can contain no more than five copepods. Those are very small swimming parasites where the female enters the tissues of host fish and form pus pockets. <laughs> Which brings us full circle back to the initial question, what about contaminated food in Latin America? Well, I'd say you better put some thought into your own contaminated food up in the States before you ask that question down here. Wow. All that, we haven't even got to the FDA's limits for mouse poop. Hmm... And that reminds me of what my old dear grandma used to say. If you sleep with your mouth open, you'll eat 10 spiders a year. And here, I thought she was BSing me. Now, I wanted to tell a really great boots on the ground story. But I'll have to wait till next time because it's too long. But I'm not done yet for today. I want to get this email in. You know, I have lots of Canadian listeners. Turns out in a lot of ways, things are more f***ed up in Canada than they are in Big Brother land as you and I know it. Canada has its own kind of Big Brother, eh? Which brings us to this email from Keith. He says, Greetings, Johnny. Keith here from Salt Spring Island, Canada. I'm a bull fiddle player slash filmmaker slash barber who, along with my genius wife, Haley, have been working on our Plan B since 2011. We are 334 days away from a one-way ticket to our jungle property near Santa Clara in the Pastaza province of Ecuador. I know they're in a problematic time and state right now and the it's hitting the fan. 
but we're not investing any more than we'd be happy to walk away from and still feel it's a fun starting point. I've done the pioneer thing for 10 years of my life when I was young. I built a sawmill and a house with the lumber, buildings, off the grid, blah, blah, blah. Though things have really changed for the worst up here since 1996. You, Johnny, you have your finger on the pulse of things. So many things. By the by, he says, your show, Johnny, is my favorite part of Fridays and Sundays. I actually walk 16 kilometers round trip to the barbershop three days a week, and your show is my great companion. But let me get back on track to the reason for this little note. When we leave to start our Plan B in 334 days, we're not bringing much down with us. Just good tools we'd have to spend big money replacing and a bit of linen. We have a very super five acres on the Rio Piatua in Ecuador. However, it's under attack presently by greedy maggots and suits. My plan is that I'm going to build simple living and eating cabanas, much like those in the indigenous village nearby. Even though I can build by hand, I'm not 21 anymore, and I'm bringing a 20-volt skill saw and a drill. And here's my big question, Johnny. What portable solar system would you recommend I bring down to change my batteries out and make a bit of light happen? We're going to eventually use as much propane as we can and have pretty much zero interest in accumulating a lot of electronic stuff. We already have a fairly rural lifestyle and have lived much that way and are used to it. So on that account, we understand what we are in for. Then he says, whoa, Johnny, sorry for the long note here, but thanks so much for being you, brother. Regards from Canada, Keith. All right, Keith, thanks for being you, too. You know, one of the reasons I'm reading this is because you sound like the kind of guy, a jack-of-all-trades, you just don't see around these days anymore. Of course, I include myself and a lot of my buddies in that category, but it really does look like we're a dying breed, doesn't it? And like you said in your email, you don't want to depend too much on electronics, but unfortunately, you have to be modern to a point and keep in touch with what's happening in the world, right? That said, here's some general advice I hope you will seriously consider. That is, if you plan on coming down to do some of what you're doing, homesteading, or you plan on living out in the boonies or in a rural area, you should start with two main things right off the bat. A nice water purifier, which you can piece together yourself, no matter where you are in Latin America, or you can order it right out of Amazon. Even when you're in Ecuador, you can get stuff from Amazon. You've heard me beat that topic to death in previous shows. All right, then secondly, what I really recommend as far as getting a portable solar unit is to order the one I recommend and have it delivered to you up in Canada. And for those of you who live in the States coming down, if you're going to do the rural homesteading thing, order it and have it delivered to your Miami forwarding service and pay the three bucks a pound or whatever for shipping. Then in a week or so, it'll end up at your Latin American destination. Now, Keith didn't tell us if he's bringing his tools and stuff down with him as luggage on the plane or if he's having that stuff shipped separately. Because if he's having it shipped separately, then he should order the portable solar panel suitcase units too and ship them with the rest of the stuff. But if he's taking his stuff with him on the plane, it'll be way too much hassle to bring the solar panels that way. So my recommendation, Keith, once you're down in Ecuador, or for anyone else who's in another Latin country, don't buy the panels till you arrive at your destination. Then get on OLX.com or the local Craigslist. They're selling solar panels all the time. You should be able to pick up two 240 or 260 waters really cheap, probably for under 300 bucks. And though they might not be that portable when you buy them that way, you can rig them up pretty easily to move with you. Whereas if you buy the actual suitcase solar panels, they'll fold in half, they'll have little carrying cases with handles on them, and you'll be able to stick them in the back seat of your car or your trunk and take them with you anywhere. But, you see, you won't be able to hand walk those things if you're flying with them on a plane. You'll have to ship them separately, which is a big hassle. So my advice, buy the all-in-one solar generator unit. It's got the lithium batteries and the converter and charger built right into it. And it's got a little handle on it, too. Have that thing shipped down through your Miami box. Or you can actually bring it as a piece of luggage because it only weighs around 30 pounds. And it's really no bigger than a very small piece of luggage. In fact, if it was a piece of luggage, you could stow it in the overhead luggage compartment in the plane with ease. But they won't let you do that because it's got lithium batteries in it. And that's the hang-up. What you'll have to do is go to the airline ahead of time, explain what it is, and they'll tell you how to pack it as a regular piece of stowed luggage. Remember, stowed luggage has a maximum of something like 55 pounds, and the little solar generator unit weighs about 30. Now, I'm talking about the 1,200-watt unit that I recommend and I actually use myself. I'm looking at it right now. It's about five feet away from me. It's a fantastic little unit, 
but it ain't cheap. If you order it on Amazon, it's going to cost you 1500 bucks, and that's without the panels. You buy those separately. However, if you order it direct from the factory in China, you can get it for half that, around 650 and shipping charges around 200 bucks. But the unit itself, rock solid and a real workhorse. And if you got four or 500 watts of panel, it'll charge up in three or four hours. And you can use the unit while it's charging. In other words, pull power from the panels while they're still charging the unit. So for all you guys out there who want to know exactly what I'm using right now for my portable setup, send me an email to expetfiles at gmail.com and I'll ship you out the info. By the way, I ordered my unit directly from China. Wired them the money, took about a month to get to Latin America, but came UPS. And of course, since the invoice said 650 bucks on it, I had to pay taxes around 200 But I know some cool ways around that, which I'm not going to mention on the air. However, if you want to do a little phone or Skype consult with me, you'll get the dope on how to drastically cut down on your import taxes. You'll also hear all about that if you're coming down to my January seminar. Speaking of the seminar, my January 2020 Expat Insider Seminar is ready to roll. You can check out the itinerary, agenda, and all the sign-up info by going to theexpatfiles.com and clicking on the seminar link or going to theexpatfiles.com slash seminar. And if you plan on coming down as a single and want to save 750 bucks by hooking up with another person, double occupancy, let me know and we can work that out too. I already hooked up a pair, but I've got a third person waiting on a roommate too. So if you're a single looking to save 750 bucks, you know what to do. And finally, if you've gone to the expatfiles.com webpage and looked at all the seminar details and info, you'll see I don't have the John Galt trips there anymore. Instead, we've gone one better, in fact, four better. My amazing bilingual logistics lady, Rita, who also owns and operates a Guatemalan travel agency, has put together four different boots-on-the-ground pre- and post-seminar trips. Because, you know, most people don't just come down for the seminar week. They stay a little before or after just to get a little more experience, meet new people, and have a look around. And, of course, the people coming down to the seminar who are also applying for Guatemalan residency, they will be staying on an extra week, so they have to have something to do. And Rita, my logistics lady, will be in charge of that. So as for the John Gold tour I used to talk about, that's been superseded by four different boots-on-the-ground excursions. Now, as far as Jen Bird... The lady formerly in charge of the John Galt trips, note, I no longer recommend her or her services. Let me repeat that. I no longer recommend her or her services. You've been listening to The Expat Files, living in Latin America. If you need some help with your own Plan B, we can schedule a one-on-one phone or Skype consult. Just send me an email, theexpatfiles at gmail.com. And if you want to get on the waiting list for my next week-long expat insider seminar in Central America, where you're guaranteed to get a two- to five-year head start on your plan B, send me an email, theexpatfiles at gmail.com. Nos vemos.